Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third in our series for this spring of uh, Chesapeake Biological Labs Science for the Community Lecture Series. This lecture series uh, is part of our ongoing commitment to explain the science we do, why it's important, and the impacts that it has on the lives of er everyday Marylanders. For our theme this year, we have chosen to look at the urban ocean. We read a lot in our newspapers and hear a lot on our televisions about the ways in which oceans are changing. And those changes are concentrated most in areas where we as society impact the ocean most, and that's in around our cities and large ports, hence the focus on the urban ocean. So far this series, we've looked at uh, ways to look at um, human health concerns, such as fecal coliform material in, in sewage streams. We have looked at ways of restoring oceans through planting a billion oysters in New York Harbor. Last week, we looked at ways of controlling invasive species uh, that are introduced into areas through the actions of shipping, unintentional introductions, but impactful nonetheless. Uh, tonight, uh, as you'll hear in a minute, we'll look at metals, a common contaminant from the industrial uh, operations that have gone on near urban ports for, for centuries now. And in the last two weeks, so on the 19th of April and on the 26th of April, we will finish this series off by looking at the distribution first of oxygen in urban oceans. Um, and it turns out that the distribution of ox oxygen is a critical regulator of the degree to which restoration is possible in these areas and uh, an issue of increasing concern, not only in the Chesapeake Bay, but globally. And in the last week on April the 26th, we'll welcome an, an architect from Morgan State who's done some groundbreaking work on understanding how to reconnect cities around the world to their harbors and coastal oceans. So it'll be a very diverse series of le lectures and ones that we're excited to bring to you. All of these lectures are videotaped and you're able to look at previous lectures if you have missed them not only from this series, but from pre previous series going back now almost a decade. And we certainly encourage you to look at some of that material. Um, so tonight, uh, as I said, we will be looking at metals in the urban ocean. And our speaker tonight is one of our faculty member here at the Chesapeake Biological Lab, Dr. Andrew Hayes. Andrew is a geochemist and a specialist in, in mercury. Uh, he's been part of teams that have looked at long-term exposures of mercury in lakes in Canada as part of what's known the Experimental Lakes Program, where they looked at the impacts not only of adding mercury to those ecosystems, but how those ecosystems recover when that addition uh, ceases. He's also looked at metals um, around the state in Maryland as part of a collaboration with our own state agencies. So I can think of no one better to give us an overview of the role of these legacy contaminants in the urban ocean uh, and to give his thoughts on, on their impacts and potentially uh, restoration trajectories. And so with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Andrew Hayes. Andrew. Thank you, Tom. Um, I guess I'll... Thank you to everyone out there in the virtual world for coming. Um, it's uh, my first real virtual live seminar, so it's kind of interesting to me, and uh, I hope it goes pretty well. And we can, and you can follow along with uh, with what I uh, plan to talk about today. All right. So first, I'm going to uh, switch over and break up my slides. So I have to share screen. What's that? Next one over. 
that's it. You're, right. good, you're good to go. Okay, well, here we are. So the title of tonight's presentation is Metals in Urban Estuaries. And it's really a, a discussion of the legacy of exploitation and trying to understand a, a way we can go forward. No changing? All right. Okay, so first I'd like to give you a little background as to how I got into uh, looking at urban estuaries. Um, my early career was in the Canadian North. That's neither urban nor an estuary. I could claim that the uh, James Bay is a, is a large estuary, and I did see that and I spent some time on it, but it is not very industrialized by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but growing up along the shores of Lake Ontario, I would uh, regularly bypass Hamilton Harbor. And Hamilton Harbor is an interesting place, and it reminds me a lot of, of Baltimore, except it's on a lake. And when you drive past uh, Hamilton on your way to Toronto, like I hope many of you have, you cross the Burlington Skyway. And there's Toronto off in the distance. And Toronto is an interesting urban center because it's very expansive along the lake and it's not industrialized, really. Hamilton, on the other hand, is very industrialized. And if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, you can just see a, a, a concrete building, which is the Canada Center for Inland Waters. And I didn't know it was there for a long period of time because I kept going over the top of it. But the view from the Canada Center for Inland Waters in the other direction is this. And this is Hamilton Harbor. So I would see this all the time. And I would be looking at this interesting mass of the industry uh, that was contaminating Hamilton Harbor. And not so much Lake Ontario, but the harbor in general was, was quite contaminated. And I always wondered about that facility and steel smelting, lots of uh, heavy manufacturing were going on, supplying the engine of Southern Ontario. So that always got me wondering about what was happening in, in the waters beneath and if actually anything was living there. So I wondered about the quality of that kind of aquatic habitat. And it was interesting because during my time as an undergraduate, I worked at a wastewater treatment plant. And that got me thinking again about where is all this waste going? And I learned about effluents. I learned about uh, how the, the network was connected to our wastewater system, and in some cases, how it wasn't. So then I started working with colleagues at Environment Canada uh, and at the Centre Saint Laurent, which is in Montreal, but also at the Canada Centre for Inland Waters, which I was driving over the top of. And, and then eventually I moved to Maryland. And I did my first urban study at the Apollo well, Academy of Natural Sciences, and we did a small study in the Anacostia River. And that was an eye-opening experience in a sense of, we were looking for a control site and we were trying to relate a contaminated site to an uncontaminated site. That's typically something that we do. Well, our control sites were just as contaminated as, as our, our contaminated sites. So I was like, oh boy, okay. So this is a very different environment. So then I did some work on the Chesapeake Bay here at the Chesapeake Biological Lab and also in, in New York Harbor. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to kind of move through this, this idea of legacy, uh, ongoing activities in the watershed, and then perhaps come up with some idea as, of what we're going to do as we move forward. Um, keep in mind that a contaminant being present doesn't necessarily mean it's consequential. That it has to be a condition where it can get into the food web to become concern to the organisms that live there and us for potentially human exposure through fishing, which is one of the things that we love to do at the Chesapeake Bay. So I'll start off with this legacy idea of dealing with the past and how important are these metals. Then we'll look at the ongoing sources from the watershed, uh, what, where, when, you know, how are, and when are they important. And then I'll look at some of our ideas about moving forward, efforts to improve some of these challenges. And, and with one thing in mind, let's not make it worse. So here's two pictures of two urban estuaries that I've worked in. I think of the Chesapeake Bay as its entirety as an urban watershed. And I also think of the Hudson River as another one. The Hudson River is 
more obvious because it is totally engulfed by urban areas. There's the Chesapeake Bay is a bit of a mishmash. We have Baltimore itself, highly industrialized. But then we've got a lot of agricultural components very close by, just across the other side of the bay from Baltimore. And then we have this large urban expanse, which is starting to fill up the watershed itself. So estuaries and lakes have similar problems, um, but estuaries have unique attributes compared to lakes. So both suffer from this urban encroachment, which was resulted in eutrophication. Nutrient runoff is our, one of our biggest concerns. But along with that comes other kinds of contaminants, organic pollutants from PCBs in the past, uh, fluorinated compounds of today, drugs coming out of the, the wastewater treatment plants, and of course, metals. Um, what's interesting, of course, about estuaries is that they are saltwater. And that's very different from a lake environment. And then the biogeochemistry then is very different. The biochemical processes which go on uh, complicate matters greatly. So in Hamilton Harbor, for instance, metals accumulate in the sediment, but the lake is fairly oligotrophic in past. And that therefore its nutrient supply is somewhat limited. And in particular, one particular nutrient, which we don't think much as being a nutrient, but that is being a sulfate. And low levels of sulfate mean that there's low levels of sulfite. Sulfate reduction is a biological process done by microbes in the sediment. And they use that as an electron acceptor. So they produce sulfide as a byproduct. And sulfide is very good at binding metals under anoxic conditions. So in Baltimore Harbor, it's mostly salt to some degree. Therefore, there's a lot of sulfate, there's a lot of sulfate reduction, and there's a lot of potential to bind metals. So as we go forward, and as we hopefully clean up the nutrients, we have to wonder what's going to happen to this whole sulfate side. And in Ontario, in Hamilton Harbor, they're already making progress, and that we're already starting to see reductions in sulfate reduction because nutrient levels are going down. But the metals are then being bound to iron oxides. So that's the other binding site that we have in the sediments to hold on the metals and make them less available. So here's a comparison between Baltimore Harbor and Hamilton Harbor. And here we have sediment on the, on the left and water on the right. And what you can see in dark blue are the concentrations of metals. These are just typical ones that I pulled out from a number of studies. And we see very high concentrations of zinc, much higher than what we have in the Baltimore Harbor in light blue. But Lead is a little bit higher in Baltimore than it is in Hamilton. But then we see other metals like chromium and copper are much higher in Baltimore than they are in Hamilton. Some of that has to do with the, the activities, but it also has to do with the geochemical environment. And then we look on the right, we look at water, we see some other different things. We see high zinc in the water in, in, in uh, Hamilton Harbor, low in Baltimore. But then when you move over and you look at copper, again, you've got high in the water in, in, in Hamilton and very low in Baltimore. So generally, the water column concentrations in Baltimore Harbor are lower than they are in Hamilton Harbor. And why is that? Well, we have this process that goes on in the estuarine environment called salting out. It's one term people use, coagulation or precipitation is another. So as the, as the metals run off or come down from the freshwater environment into Baltimore Harbor and they hit the salt water, then interesting things start to happen. We start to see this coagulation. The, the ion strength of the water is much higher. And then we start to see these aggregations of, of particles and along with it, some of the metals, and they start to salt out and are deposited to the sediment. So that happens fairly quickly. And as a result, then we have a lot lower concentrations of metals in the harbor than we do in the sediment below. And then you see that difference in Hamilton Harbor where you don't have the same salting out process. So here's some theoretical stuff that goes to support that and some observations. And theoretical stuff is always nice and that's what we see on the left. And you see the, the dark line at the top is the, the theoretical model uh, precipitation. And then on, on the bottom we see uh, a couple of other, uh, I can't really point, can I? You can use the pointer on the, on the com computer. Uh, you can move your mouse. Oh, I can move the mouse and see that. Okay, where you point it. Okay, here we go. So up, up here, we have this sorbed to iron oxide line here. 
which is the theoretical line. And that's for zinc and then copper down here. And then we have lead down here. And then here we have things which are bonded, dissolved organic matter. And then down at the bottom here, we have what's actually dissolved in the water column. So what happens is things drop out really, really quickly in theory. And you can do experiments to do this in a tank. You actually increase the salt. You then add in your iron and you watch it drop out or your zinc or your copper. And you can look at the time. You look at how the salinity gradient impacts that. And what we have over here is reality. And uh, reality is always fun in that it never works quite as well as you think because estuaries are very dynamic. We have tides, the salt water gradient changes, and we've got other things in our models that we sometimes have trouble uh, modeling, but we still get the same idea. Here we have dissolved copper going down across the salinity gradient. And similarly down here, we have lead coming down across the salinity gradient. But of course you have data that's sometimes hard to explain because of the seshing of tides and so on, which goes on and the resuspension of things. But generally speaking, we have this salting out process. So the salinity uh, increases, organic matter aggregates, it removes complex metals from the water column. Now that's important for biota. Removal takes metals away from the pelagic food web, but then exposes it to the benthic food web. Behaviors of metals is complicated, its conditions over time change, and metals are complex because they like to form ligands and ligands with organic matter or with sulfide or things I mean, it's, it's control, in essence influences what we call the speciation and that affects the bioavailability and a good example of that is copper the most toxic form of copper is the free ion which then diffuses across the, the gill membranes for certain fish but there's very little of that typically in, in the environment but if you can change the, chem the chemistry by removing organic matter, for instance, then you can increase the availability of copper to the fish. So it gets quite, quite complicated. So moving along with Baltimore Harbor, I like looking back at historical pictures. And this is a great one that I found of Baltimore Harbor back in the early 1800s. And you don't see a whole lot of industry in Baltimore Harbor back then. Uh, you, you can see that it is, is drawn anyway or illustrated as a as an urban environment but fairly devoid of industry that really did change <laughs> and then we have you can find these satellite shots of of baltimore harbor in the 1950s and you can see incredible industrial expansion and what i want to point out is that if you look around in some of these slides you can really see how uh, unprotected the water is from the industrial activities at the time. Runoff of things into the sediment was pretty much uninhibited. And you can, you can see as you look around and recognize different points, you can see the extent of the industrialization. Pretty incredible. Of course, all of this gets recorded. And this was Rob Mason, who was a professor here uh, back a number of years ago, um, worked on this uh, with Jeff Cornwell over at Corn Point, who's still here. And they did a series of course throughout the, the Baltimore Harbor. And you can see the history of industrialization in the sediment cores, depending where you take them from. And I've just highlighted a few things where this paint manufacturing, and that coincides with iron ore production. Uh, you can see peaks in, in uh, arsenic, and you can see peaks in lead. So, and then they use radiocarbon dating to produce the dates, which you see are as the estimated dates down the side. So you can see this huge industrial expansion in the 1700s up into the 1800s, and then another peak in the 1960s. And as you move around the harbor, these profiles change a little bit depending on what the proximity to the industry that was, uh, that was resident. So, <laughs> The legacy of industrialization has greatly impacted the urban estuary. And this is, this is true for the greater Baltimore Harbor. And unfortunately, one of the things you have to do is keep a harbor functioning. And now from a biological perspective, we saw all of those metals, most of them were buried deep into the sediment and we'd like to leave the sleeping giant down there because they're not available to biota. But that's not the reality that, that we live in. So how do you deal with that? 
I got involved with the state on a project um, involving dredging. And in particular, in, in this study, we were disposing of the, these uh, sediments from Baltimore Harbor. So the sediments from the main channel end up on Poplar Island, whereas what I call the nasties were ending up in Hart Miller Island. So these are highly contaminated sediments from the main channels of the harbor itself. And Baltimore uh, decided that the best way to do this cost efficiency wise was to create an island, encapsulate the sediment in essence, and cover it, which is the process which is ongoing right now. Thereby they would keep these sediments locked up in its, their own environment for the eternity in essence. Uh, and then hopefully utilize the surface of the island for other things. And this is done in other places in the world. And there are other spots around Baltimore Harbor where we can encapsulate the sediment. Um, one of the issues that goes with this is that you have to keep the sediments anoxic. And the original plan was to dredge the material out, dewater it, and then put the sediment into the island itself, fairly dry. Well, times change. Got to dredge faster, ships were getting bigger, so they didn't dewater it, they put it in wet. You had to wait for the dewatering to occur on site and pump the water off. And that created a series of challenges because as the sediment becomes oxygenated, that hydrogen sulfide, which is binding the metals, changes, it becomes sulfuric acid, and that result results in the release of metals. In essence, it just leaches them right out of the system. So what we were charged with was monitoring during this process around the, the island, looking at stations in the sediment, looking at biota to understand, to make sure that what was deposited in Harmel Island was actually staying there. So as you can see, this is on the, on the map there, this is Harmel Island year 33, and we were doing this for a long time. And we were monitoring in different ways and here I have just showing you some plots of sediment concentrations. So this was from year 35, so in 2015. And what you see is the black dots are the average concentrations we were seeing over time. The red dots is the median. And then the bars are the actual concentrations of that year. So we would follow them every year and we would monitor looking for any hotspots. Some of these were close to areas where there were outflow and discharge places, and others were reference sites. So what you see there on the right then is the, uh, we used clams as a biomarker and the concentrations of arsenic that year were much lower than they were in the sediment, so they were not being exposed. And that was part of the natural variability. And if you're really bored one night, you can actually find all those reports online and you can read them in their entireties. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's look at some of the current studies of, of watershed metal sources. Um, the, ma the major loadings are from stormwaters and wastewaters. Um, who does this research? Um, it's very poorly organized now in the country. It was better organized years ago. USGS has done a number of what I call targeted studies. They go to a place, they measure everything under the sun. And then they move on and they go somewhere else and do the same thing, metals, organic contaminants, and so on. And they give you little snapshots of what's going on. Um, there's almost little to no continuous monitoring anymore. Uh, at the uh, USGS, at the water monitoring gauges used to have some chemistry ones as well and would monitor those over time, but those have pretty much dried up. The state also uses targeted approaches. Uh, it's done so for PCBs and for nutrients. We create what's called TMDLs. We create targets for, for uh, how much we're going to let of a certain compound or contaminant into the water. And then we pass it on to the counties and they are then responsible for meeting those TMDLs. So that's how the state of Maryland does it. Other states do it differently. We rely heavily on extrapolating these studies and studies done elsewhere in the world to bring together our understanding of what's going on because we have a lot of data gaps right now. We do not have very good continuous monitoring except for a few locations. And I have one of them. Um, urban runoff, that's probably one of the most understudied components that we have. Um, I think it's because it's really hard. Um, it's a very challenging environment to work in. I was joking with a colleague upstairs, you know, he goes up to the Arctic and he's trying to get out there and he's want to get out there when the ice is retreating and going back and he's planning it a year ahead. And who knows when the ice is going to melt and 
and so on. And I find the same way in the urban systems. When's it gonna rain? How am I gonna get there? Uh, do I have people available and so on? So typical concentrations of dissolved metals in urban runoff. Uh, I've pulled these from a water quality database and, and I've compared them to the what I see in Baltimore Harbor on the very far left. And there's open sites. So these are just fields, mixes of uh, residential areas to fully residential areas in red and then industry in orange. And it's just exactly how you would think. You see the high concentrations of metals in industrial areas and low concentrations of metals in the harbor because I've shown that they precipitate out. I had a colleague come and work with me uh, back in 2005. And what he was looking at was mercury runoff. And as Tom said earlier, one of my great interests is, is mercury. It's one of the more fascinating metals. And what you see here is our two, two plots. It's uh, mercury concentrations in nanograms per liter. And then the fine line that's here, this is the hydrograph. So what you see is the rain comes and then he starts monitoring and we see this is the dissolved mercury concentration here, which is slightly lower than what I've shown here in rain. And then this is the particulate load. So most of the mercury that comes off is in the furrows. And then when you have a longer rain event, you see that you scrub it all out and then the later stuff, it's pretty much all dissolved. But the concentrations are fairly low and representative of rain. A lot of the mercury that we get is released from coal-fired power plants, goes up into the atmosphere and rains out. So what we found was the urban surface wasn't a major source of mercury. But there was another study being conducted back in, in Germany by a group led by Frick. And he was in looking at, at mercury runoff in Frankfurt. And then he actually started looking at storms and storm sewers, and he was looking at sewer sources. And it, it puzzled him for a little while because there was a disconnect. Concentrations that were coming out were higher than they should have been under certain conditions. And then what he found was that during high, really high rain events, the sewer system was connecting to the stormwater system. Because in some of the older cities, they're leaky. They are connected improperly, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not. And, and sometimes by design, in a sense of you have to protect your treatment plants. So this is also true with, with water treatment plants. When there's huge rain events, they turn off their intakes, right? They don't take water from the river to protect the system. It's the same with sewage treatment plants. They have to be careful. So what he saw was these enormous loads of mercury coming out, 300 nanograms per liter in the wastewater. So that suggests that, boy, our wastewaters are pretty contaminated with, with mercury and with other metals, and that's not surprising. So those concentrations are quite variable and sometimes higher and sometimes lower than the estuarine waters. And of course, a lot of the, the connectivity depends on the infrastructure that you have in place. And I've shown a little picture here, and what we see is this kind of water runoff collection structures, which are being built everywhere. And they're there and they're designed actually just to slow the water down from getting and causing erosion and slowing it from getting to the rivers. And in the meantime, they collect particles. So they do a reasonable job at collecting particles. Um, but they don't do a very good job of, of retaining metals. And, and uh, I put a plug in there for Keith Ashelman, who's been working on uh, what we call swales. And you'll see these along the sides of roads and they are basically the water will run into the middle of the road and there's a number of them on highway 301 and then some of the major highways heading out into western maryland and they're there to collect the water the idea is to, again to slow it down from going into the adjacent creeks but what keith has found is that it does absolutely nothing to stop metals and it pretty much does very little hydrologically either so while they're trying, sometimes the actual implementation of designs isn't, isn't working out very well. And it's the same as some of these mitigation of these runoff ponds. Um, so what about the rest of the watershed? Um, here, we have the typical weir. Uh, this is at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center under high storm flow and nice dirty water coming out. 
And then what I've, I've pictured on the other side are is a Nisco water sampler. And this is basically how we, we go about collecting water from, from uh, events. So the sampler collects over time. We get a flow weighted discharge number. Uh, concentration to go with our, our discharge. So we can actually calculate the flux of metals out of, out of the watershed. So it's pretty easy to do in an environment like this where it's controlled. Uh, you have uh, limited access. You sit there by the stream, you collect your water samples and so on, it's very nice. And all the data we collect looks something like this. This is from an agricultural watershed and from our reference watershed. We follow, as I showed you earlier, we follow the precipitation, which is, um, which is shown in, in green here. And then we have our, our hydrology and you see the storm, you see the runoff events associated. And what you see from here, we have a big spring flow. We have usually dry summers, and then we have a period of winter recharge. And that's the way typically the hydrology works in a normal watershed. And then when you look at mercury, then we have in black, we have the mercury concentrations in the uh, 110 watershed, which is our forested watershed. And we have it the, in the pink 109, our agricultural watershed. And it's not exactly how you would imagine that actually coming out of the forested watershed, mercury concentrations are much higher. And that's because mercury is dropped by atmospheric deposition. It's scavenged on the surfaces of leaves. The leaves are deposited, it gets decomposed, and that's the big source of mercury to the watershed. So the, the, the leaves act as a big collector. Whereas on the agricultural, you don't, you don't have that. The crop's taken off or the mercury is removed. So you have much less dissolved mercury coming out. And then I put this picture together because this really starts to exemplify the challenges of moving into a more urban system. Um, the streams are not above ground. <laughs> they are underground. You have to have creative ways to get to where the water is coming out and where it's exposed. And in this particular case, they have it installed in the sewer itself. That presents all kinds of challenges to get access. And of course, then for your equipment to actually survive both the storm events and the fact that it's in an urban system where it's not controlled. Very difficult to, to, to get that. So we're often relying on the research of others to piece together what's going on. So as I said, Frick uh, pointed out that there was a lot of mercury in wastewater. So one of the st studies that the, the state had me do was to look at wastewater treatment plants. So back in 2008, I sampled a whole bunch of wastewater treatment plants in Maryland. And what we found was the concentration of mercury coming out of those wastewater treatment plants was really low. It was about a nanogram per liter. And in some places in California, it's lower than that. They have even fancier systems and can take it out. So the mercury isn't coming out of the wastewater treatment plant, but it's going in. So where, where's it going? <laughs> What you see on the bottom is a simplified version of a wastewater treatment plant system, system here. And then what I want to point out is this particular thing here. And this is called the solid sludge. This is the biosolids. And there are a couple of places where that's taken out of the system. And that ends up in what we call an anaerobic digester. And your microbes are chomping on that, chomping on that. And they basically work the massive waste down. And then that waste has to go somewhere. And it always makes me wonder where that goes. Well, it can go to a landfill and some of it goes, but a lot of it doesn't. Uh, a lot of it goes to fields. And I'm sure you've seen them spraying it onto agricultural fields. Well, it's loaded with nutrients, but it's also loaded with other things. And uh, so this is kind of an interesting summary. I started looking at, well, what, what do we know about this? Because how regulated is this? And you can come up with, you know, an idea of what the concentrations are from different, different places. And what I've shown on the bottom here are, are cadmium, copper, nickel, lead, and zinc from two particular studies that actually looked at, well, what happens when you put the stuff on fields? And there's a, quite a difference in concentrations than what they actually saw. So of course, they're actually going out there and measuring it once it's mixed in, not what's being sprayed out. And then I came, I found this, and this gives you a list of different countries and how much they are allowed to have in the sludge. And I pulled up what the US is, and it's on the high end of what we've seen people put on the fields. But I've only been able to find a couple of studies 
where they've looked short term, looking at the flux off these particular fields. But it concerns me a great deal because with the urban expansion, we're going to continue to have these waste problems. And of course, it's going to go to local fields, so it could contribute back into the Chesapeake Bay. So with uh, Al Place uh, and his graduate student, Jans Lira from the Institute of Marine Environmental Technology, which is our sister lab up in Baltimore, we're actually starting to look at some fields where we have water called bioreactors or permeable reactive barriers. And these are placed there to remove nutrients. The idea is that uh, you pack in some sort of reactive material, so wood chips being one, and you trap the nutrients as they're coming out as you've got a, a bioreactor in there, which is gonna do the denitrification for you and limit the amount of nitrogen which gets into the adjacent water. So Al has some ideas about different materials to use and that's what we're studying. But one of the things we're looking at are the unintended consequences because you know, we were a little concerned about the wood chips because the source of wood chips is unknown. So you've got the metals on the field potentially, not in this case, this is a control, but why do we put in a lot of our wood? We put in arsenic. We put it in there as a, as a in pressure treated wood, right? So of course that's going to end up in this material and that could be coming out. And sure enough, uh, you do see a little bit of arsenic coming out. Whether it's high or low relative to the, you know, what's normally coming off the field, we're still working that out. This is the first year of the study. But what we want to use this for is a, is a pilot to move on to look at fields which are amended with other stuff. And the reason for that is, well, you're putting all that stuff that's coming out of the wastewater treatment plant onto the fields. Well, what's in that stuff? Antibiotics. You're putting in there other metals and things, which could affect the performance of these bioreactors. So this is very always, there's always a cycle, right, that we have to look at. So there's a lot of metals around in the urban waters, but which are the ones of concern to the food web? Well, the food web is a complicated thing. Um, and when you move into an urban system, we started to realize that we really don't know much about what's what is the food web in Baltimore Harbor look like. You know, we have these wonderful diagrams and stuff, but a lot of these pieces are missing when you get into the Baltimore Harbor. So we, we wanted to figure out what was going on there. There's lots of theories, but there's very, very little, little data. So I got involved with a study that uh, Ryan Woodland started with Laura Harris and Eric Schott, and they were looking at food web restructuring across the urban gradient. Perfect, I can go and look at some metals, and, and I did. Um, and what Ryan did was he was wondering what was the impact of the different habitats uh, related to the watershed itself. So what we mean by that is here, here we have the redder it gets, the more urban it gets. So we looked at different tributaries that were loaded from different urban gradients and then one down here. What's interesting about this one here, Bear Creek, is that that's really contaminated metals. So if you were gonna find high metals in the food web, you'd think you would find it there. So we sampled fish from all these different tributaries, and then we related it to what was going on in, in the watershed to look for this, what we call trophic connectivity hypothesis. So what we thought we would find is that as Mercury would decrease as the benthic connectivity uh, increases. So that what I, my hypothesis was most of the mercury that was coming in and getting into the food web was the mercury that was coming off the watershed. And that's because of Tom related to studies I've done at the, the experimental length survey, where it was the new mercury coming into the system, which was what was bioavailable, not the stuff that was the old mercury in the settlements. So that was my driving idea behind this. And then Ryan put this together in a more uh, complex model, uh, looking at as we go from the shallow habitat to less shallow habitat, the mercury concentration would increase. And then he came up with this nice diagram here, which explains it very well. So what you have here is this, when you have extensive shallow water habitat, the fish have choices, pelagic and benthic. And then as, you, as the urban gradient becomes stronger and stronger, you get more runoff, and if you get less benthic habitat, then we got higher mercury concentrations of fish. And that's exactly what we found. So that means that the fish are getting the mercury from the water column. But how does that happen? Fish don't typically take up inorganic mercury. They take up what's called methyl mercury. Well, that means the mercury has to get methylated somewhere along the way. Well, mercury methylation typically is thought as being an anaerobic process. 
done by the sulfate reducing bacteria, what we talked about a little bit earlier. So my hypothesis was that the metals are bioavailable just during the post runoff period. Well, what's the source, what comes with the metals during runoff is nutrients. So what we would see is we often see is these algal blooms. And typically when people see algal blooms, they take, they go over days. Well, these ones are really quick. They come and they go. Very difficult then to sample. So what we've been able to do is cut through this by looking at the food web itself. And we can see that kind of connectivity. So we can see that it's actually the pelagic food web that's really important. And so this kind of gives us some lessons learned here that you know, we can use these classification systems to start pointing us in the right direction to do, to do future research. So is there any direct evidence for linking nutrients to algal blooms and then metal transfer into the food web? I'm starting to get there. So uh, again, working with another colleague at IMAT, uh, we were able to start thinking about this process and he'd been observing algal blooms, Hang Chen, at, at IMAT, was looking at how quickly these things were occurring and then how quickly they were degrading. And he was seeing the presence of bacteria very, very quickly during the cycle. So the al algae appeared, the bacteria were right there. You know, the, they know a meal is coming, I think. <laughs> so, and then something I want to talk about in a minute, we, we looked at this in, in one particular case. Uh, so these are, this is a, 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 an aeration event. So it's the same kind of idea where we suddenly introduce a whole bunch of nutrients into the system. And suddenly we get an algal bloom and that's shown here related to the particulate carbon. And I also saw sulfide in the water column which is bizarre because it wasn't anoxic. So, and then also we saw a big jump in methylmercury. So suddenly we have a bloom, we have bacteria, we have sulfide, oh, we have methylmercury, and then it was gone. So suddenly you have a big pulse of methylmercury available to be taken up in the food web, right, right there. And of course, if I was still sleeping and then I got out there to collect my sample, I would not have known anything. So going forward, I started working on a project uh, where we're looking at aeration, which is what I just briefly mentioned. And what we want to do is we want to remove the nutrients, we want to improve the water, water quality, we want to increase light, we want seagrasses, we want all this stuff to be just, just wonderful. So eventually we're going to aerate the, the sediment in that process. And what worries me then is, well, what about all these metals which are held by sulfide? What's going to go on there? So the aeration is giving me a chance to look as a glimpse into the future, I think, about what's going on. So this is a study called Rock Creek Aeration Study. And the aeration was done in Rock Creek, which is just off Baltimore Harbor, to, to look to get rid of this sulfide smell. And this was initiated 20 years ago. And the idea was that if we turn over water column, we can stop the sulfide from building up. So, we're already seeing, as I said, in Hamilton Harbor, we're seeing progress, and, but there the metals are just binding to iron oxides. But of course, in the urban estuary, we're, we're not sure what's going to happen because of the sulfate. So anyway, this is what I mean by um, turning over the water. Typically what happens in deep water systems, you get stratification over the summer. You get hot water on top, cold water on the bottom, circulation sets up, and they don't meet except bubbles come up. Bubbles pass right through that. And those bubbles, in this case, contain stinky hydrogen sulfide. And that's what the neighbors were complaining about. Rock Creek is very shallow. It's only a few meters deep. So this is an unusual condition for sulfide to be occurring like that. So I was kind of puzzled about that. But you know, the system was put in, the data was collected, and, and you know, obviously it had an impact because the sulfide has gone away. And what they did was they put in an aeration system they bubble, water, bubble air up through the water column. It turns the water over. So we got involved in this, uh, especially Laura Lapham and I, because we weren't the nutrient people. That, that was Laura Harris and Jeremy Testa who are here at CBL. But we were looking at the unintended consequences. And in the case of Laura Lapham, she's looking at methane. So, but I was interested in what was happening to the metals because if you turn this off, then we should see stratification and we should see some sort of change, we should see sulfide in the bottom water. That's what I thought would happen. And here's a picture of Rock Creek with the little bubblers going. And there's just a line of them and, and one end of the creek. 
And that was based on this old, old data. You have a look at the plot from this. This was way back in 1997, I think I did this. Oh, 1998, January 98. So here I did some incubations with some cores, and we, and we would actually take sediment. This is actually Florida Everglades mud. And we would let them sit overnight. And when it went dark and the plants went to sleep and there was no oxygen going into the system, suddenly they would become an oxid. And what we saw was sulfide down here starting to come up into the water column of some of the cores and along with it, methylmercury. So it fluxes out of the sediment. That's what I expected to see at Rock Creek when we turn the radars off. So we studied three loca four locations, Rock Creek 1, 2, 7, and 9, are stations that were identified as part of an earlier study. Two, one and two are right by the aerators. Seven is in the theoretical zone of influence and RC9 is our control station. And this is what we saw. So this is an example, this is methylmercury. And what you see is here is while the aerators are on in dark red on the 10th. We turned the aerators off that night. We went back out and sampled the next day. Boom, methylmercury. Nutrients were there. Everything went bananas. Chlorophyll went up. Chlorophyll stayed up for a little while. Methylmercury went away, and and then it was gone. So here is the the end day. This is when I thought I would actually see the methylmercury, and it, it never happened because it never really got an oxid. Sulfide never really got into the water column. So that was quite quite interesting. And then we we did the same thing again. Whoops! In the in the following year, in in 2019, and we just basically followed it, except not with all the time points in between front and end, and we got no difference. So what happened between 2018 and 2019 is they, they put in the new aeration system. They changed the bubble design, they increased the bubble flow. It's much higher, denser bubble flow in a smaller area. And that seems to have changed the dynamics to some extent. Uh, we see much less methylmercury. We saw a lot of methylmercury in the water column during the aerations before that. Um, but not so after that. So we don't see sulfide in, in the bottom waters at all. So that process, the methylation there is not providing methylmercury to water column. It's the nutrients, it's, it's methylation in the water column, which I think is, is, is fascinating. So conclusions, our understanding of metal cycling uh, relies on extrapolation, pulling things together from many sources because we don't have many ongoing studies because it's very difficult and very expensive. Um, unfortunately, though, we're making some decisions in the, in the watershed, uh, particularly in the Baltimore Harbor area. Um, they want to make a number of changes to the watershed. They want to make it uh, more livable, um, green space, wetlands, all sorts of things. But we really don't have the data, the baseline data, I think, to make intelligent decisions. Um, the, we don't have a good understanding of the current conditions. The, the study that Ryan led is one of the first ones looking at food web in Baltimore, and that is somewhat staggering. Technologies, we're, we're starting to design them. Aeration is going in and reservoirs all over the place um, for various reasons, uh, yet we don't really know what the overall impacts are going to be because they have consequences that we don't understand yet. Um, there's been discussions of aeration that we could use and to speed up the process in, in the Chesapeake Bay as well. And again, we don't understand all the consequences of those kinds of decisions. So acknowledgements, um, my partners here at CBL, Ryan, Laura, Laura, Jeremy, and Johan on the Baltimore Harbor Metals, Cindy Gilmore at CERP, uh, working on the mercury fluxes from watersheds, Al Place, Fang Chang, and Eric Shaw, I met for some of the, the work looking at algal blooms and, and uh, and potential waste effluent. Funding usually comes from Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Department of the Environment, NSF. And with that, I'll take, take questions. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, this is a Zoom conference rather than a Zoom meeting. So we can't unmute you to ask your questions. But if you care to type your questions into the chat box, I will be happy to moderate those questions and, and hold Andrew to account for answering those questions. So let me 
Um, stop the screen share so you can see Andrew um, there and um, we'll entertain questions and uh, I will um, start waiting while we wait for questions to come in to ask some of my own. Um, and uh, right, so let, let's begin. So and, Andrew, you highlighted the historical nature of contamination in Baltimore. And you mentioned about the, the dates when sort of paint production and other things. And you had a vertical scale that was time, but you didn't mention what the actual depths were. So how, how deep are those contaminated sediments in the sediment themselves? Um, it varies on location, but because the sedimentation rate determines the depth and the age. So they're often a meter or greater down for some of the really bad, the big blip. Um, there is another blip, which is probably 25 centimeters down, which we can pick up. What I didn't actually mention for Rock Creek, which I also found stunning, you saw the pictures of the aerators and you see any industry there, did you? Concentrations of, of mercury in those sediments are almost as high as Baltimore Harbor, which is fascinating. Why is that? I don't know. No, obviously, industrial source. No industrial high. source. So, and those sediments, those cores that we took there are about 20 centimeters deep. Um, they're not very deep. So they're just the upper, upper sediment. So there's the sediment moves around. So that's a concern. If you take surface sediments in Bear Creek, they are still loaded with chromium. Okay. Um, they're, they're almost a milligram. All, All right. Milligram. So questions then from the audience from Maureen, Maureen Harvey. Sorry, Maureen. Um, can you talk more about what these metals mean for wildlife? Okay, so uh, mercury is the, one of the most important ones in the aquatic food web because it's a neurotoxin uh, for that. So what happens is the mercury bioaccumulates up the food web. So the higher you go, the predators um, start to have issues. So we're talking a lot about uh, osprey, uh, birds of prey like that, which are feeding on larger fish. Um, we've seen impacts on, on some fish, um, particularly sturgeon. Uh, they can also start to have reproductive issues at concentrations of the high rates that we see in them. So we definitely know mercury is a problem. As I said, copper is different. Copper, it has to be in the uh, free ion form. So it has to occur in very select situations. Um, it's often a problem for uh, organisms lower down on the food web, which have no defense because of their gills. Uh, things like shrimp and stuff are suffer from that. We have selenium is another one where you move from, basically, a, if you go up a factor of 10, you go from essential to toxic for some organisms. So selenium is an issue for some, and that starts to affect some of their, uh, their uh, regulatory processes that, uh, not affect neurological, but affect other organ function. Um, we've, we've seen that with uh, tadpoles and stuff in freshwater environments. You get edema kind of thing forming those. So we've looked at that, but we haven't done much of that in the saltwater environment. Okay, thank you. So um, Josh Hastings goes back to your comments about biosolids from wastewater and asks about, do we need more te testing um, of those biosolids? solids to at least know what's being placed on the food. I, I would say so. And, and in particular, not just metals, but for a range of other compounds. Um, we don't have a good understanding of what's in the digesters over time. I, I know they do periodic testing. I just don't think it's that frequent. Um, and of course, if we're going to go and deposit it somewhere, you would like to know what, what happens to it as well. As I said, there's been a couple of studies, but not that many. And certainly with a lot of the awareness for newer compounds, I think we, we need to do some more investigations on, on different systems, what they produce and, and what to do with them. Okay. So I was driving over the Bay Bridge today and saw the ever forward still stuck firm on the approaches to Baltimore Harbor. And, and Janet Barnes asked specifically about 
the sediments that are around that ship that are being removed to try and refloat it? And, and would you have any concerns about the composition of those sediments? They are um, in an area which is, as I understand it, categorized as being fairly benign for base standards. So they'll end up in Poplar Island, also because of, there's nowhere else for it to go right now. Um, so I'm not super concerned about them. Um, my concern is, is that they're resuspending a lot of material. I didn't see any signs of curtains. No. So I am I am concerned about where that stuff is is going, just because of the volume of it into the channel, and I don't think there's any protection for the biota around that. Okay. And it it does make me wonder about who the regulatory whose regulatory responsibility is this, and I'm not I don't have that answer. Okay, um, so Jack Templeton asks. Uh, about runoff ponds, and he sees as he drives around a range of different kinds of aeration systems. Um, some, you know, they spray it up into the air like it's a decorative fountain. Others are, are bubbling systems. Is there rhyme or reason for those differences, or is it just when the pond was built? Um, there's definitely historical timing to when it was built and, and what companies the people talk to. There's a lot of companies doing the small scale stuff like that, that um, are, that they're only there to stop it stinking. So that's their approach. And that's true, right? The waters could sit there for a long time. They're revisiting this idea in Florida a lot now because of mosquitoes and because of mosquitoes that carry things which are a little bit more deadly than they used to be. So there's great concern down there about what we should be doing or whether we should be using these things at all. Because then, of course, you have to add chemical to kill the mosquitoes, which is another problem. So the designs have evolved, as you've seen, and I don't think there's a great uh, understanding of where we go. Okay. Um, so Ted Turner sort of builds from your comment about the variation locally in the contaminant burden, the contaminant profile in the sediments it seems that local conditions really are important. And yet the EPA and other state agencies are trying to manage this entire watershed. So what, what's the challenge or what's on the horizon perhaps in trying to develop common methods, common standards that give us information at a broad watershed scale but still address this issue that you raised about local conditions. Is there, is there any way of reconciling those shorts of vast amounts of money? So the idea of the TMBL was to address that by looking at all the different water bodies, rivers and so on, watersheds and giving them an assignment, but that was to a big picture number. So, a jurisdiction can choose to fix a couple of systems and not others. And this also then gets into whether or not this is a fair way of going about doing it politically, um, because there are historical inequities that underlie a lot of the decisions that have been made. So it's, a, it's, a, it's very difficult. We need, I think, a lot more targeted studies looking in, in areas which have been understudied in the past. And that's why I, I point to you know, the areas around Baltimore Harbor. And we're seemingly leaping ahead to, to start doing some cleanup process without really understanding the cause and effect. And with not much background data to what's there right now and what the plans might do. Um, that requires some think tanks. It requires a lot of funding to to put some of these, I want to say, test scenarios, test studies into place and wait for the results. Um, one of the things that I've, I've seen is that we keep barreling ahead and the, the question earlier about the aeration systems and people thought, okay, great, we'll, we'll put these things in and stuff, but they don't really know what it's doing. Uh, years ago, I, with Chris Rao here, who's the uh, uh, reptile amphibian uh, scientist, he, 
you know, we're looking at all these ponds going like, man, these are interesting places for amphibians and maybe we'll see a resurgence of amphibians. And, and now we're kind of aerating them and doing all kinds of things. And we're not sure exactly if that's good or bad. We don't know if the tadpoles, for instance, would like to be in an aerated pond. Uh, how well they would do. Um, we have we talked the same way with the aeration systems and how that affects the food web. If we put a bunch of aerators out in, in a river to help stimulate denitrification, what does that do to the food web? The, the plankton certainly aren't going to like those. So there's cause and effects that we have to, to, to think about as well as the, the geochemistry, which I always find is the mundane, boring thing that people forget, but it's the elephant in the room often because that's the contaminants, that's where they are. But uh, no one wants to acknowledge that they're there. All right, and then last question of, of the night um, from Bill Rains, uh, a frequent attendee at the, these uh, events. And it really goes back to your comment just now about things going on in Baltimore Harbor. And as you well know, there is a commitment for Baltimore Harbor to be swimmable, fishable, drinkable, and several high profile citizens have committed to swimming across the inner harbor in a few years time. Um, thoughts? Um, yeah, I think it's, um, I think if, if we can start, once I start to see a food web start to be restored and things, then I'll start to think about swimming. Um, I think we have a, a ways to go. Um, I think we have a lot of uh, things to deal with in the watershed. Uh, the algal blooms, the harmful algal blooms, which are now becoming prevalent, uh, both in fresh and salt water systems, are something that we're quite concerned about. Um, and I think the timetable is uh, a, a, a little, um, probably, I want to say in my lifetime, uh, I would like to see swimmable and fishable. I don't think we'll see very Okay. All right. Well, looking at the clock, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to end it there. I'm going to thank Andrew one last time for his presentation this evening. I'm going to remind you all that the presentation will be available probably sometime tomorrow on our Science for Communities website if you want to refer back to it. I remind you that we have two presentations left in this series. Next week, Jeremy Tester will be here to talk about oxygen and the distribution of oxygen in urban uh, oceans. And then in the final week, uh, we welcome Samia Kirshner, who's going to be talking about how we can reconnect cities back to their harbors. And so with that, I thank you all for your attendance. This evening, Andrew, thank you once again for your presentation, and I look forward to seeing all of you next weekend. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>